it is it's good to be with everybody uh welcome to the think differently podcast the idea behind the podcast get behind the scenes a little bit to provoke some thinking and our guest today uh i'm really stoked to be able to talk to uh the reverend doctor the right royal mike frost who is an author a speaker um a leader of community missiologist lecturer like you have a lot of titles uh mike can i say uh, is that just an accumulation uh, well, do of I? I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. I've kind of cobbled together a kind of a, uh, I've welded together a bunch of different aspects of life, which keeps it interesting. Yeah, so it's yeah, no, it's not just one single thing I do. But if we're going behind the whatever, what's it called? Going behind? I think differently. Like so we just get a little bit behind. You're thinking differently, thinking. going behind things. Like, are you going to admit, like, right up front, this is the second time we're having this conversation? Listen, or let, we... let, I've got to be truthful with our audience, Mike. This is the second time that we are recording because uh, the technical dyslexic at this end of things managed to hit a button that he shouldn't have hit and muted you last time in the recording. So this is, that was, I just put that down to, that was a great rehearsal. So it was for a the, run through. For, yeah. for run through. For the second time, I'd like to welcome <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Mike Frost, um, author of books like Exiles, uh, Jesus the Fool, Surprise the World, Keep Christianity Weird. Let me just ask you a question straight out of the gate. Which was the book that you enjoyed writing the most? Which was the one you sat there going, oh, this is just, this is so much fun? Or, or, or are they all, is it like choosing a child? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, you do come to, I mean, it is a little bit like choosing a child, but like, you know, and you can say who's your funniest kid or who's your, your most athletic kid. I mean, you know, you can make comments on them. I'd say the one that, that just came out the most easily, I mean, just sort of poured out of me. It was all written very quickly, uh, was a book called The Road to Missional. And, okay. uh, Actually, I was I was staying in LA for six months on a sabbatical. I was staying with Alan and Deborah Hirsch in their home, and I I I wrote that on their dining room table in I don't know a couple of months or something ridiculous. It just kind of so in one respect that was great fun. I, as I was writing, I'm like typing away, thinking this is just pouring out of me. So that was good. Others have been more laborious, like the shaping of things to come, which has been my most successful book in terms of sales. Oh my gosh, that took years and it was just, oh, it was tedious and difficult and it was torn apart and put back together. And by the time I signed off on it, I said to Alan, who I co-authored that with Alan Hirsch, and uh, I said to Alan, like, just submit it, I'm over it. Like, I, I've <laughs> and lo and behold, I mean, it just went crazy in terms of sales. It's just, it just opened up so many different parts of the world to me and to Alan. So who, you know, who knows? You can never tell. What, what do you think that, that that taps into? I mean, this is not part of the formal part, but I'm intrigued by it. What do you think that taps into within the Christian or the church sphere that a book, a book like that and books like Christ, Keep Christianity Weird and Surprise the World are so sought after? Oh, man, I can't answer that on, on the shaping of things to come because the shaping of things to come, uh, there's, you know, I'm not going to say nobody was thinking that way. I mean, lots of people were, which is where we kind of drew our, our inspiration from. But a lot of those ideas around what we now kind of call the sort of missional paradigm, for want of a better term, tended to be more highfalutin ideas that kind of people had university symposia about or were discussed, you know, at theological colleges or... Um, and for some reason, somehow, and it was not by formula because, as I said, it was just such a messy process, we managed to put it into words that just popularised it. And, and how it how it hit an audience the way it did, I, I, you know, it's inexplicable. I mean, if I guess if you knew, you would just, like, keep writing books like that all the time. But, um, no, it's I actually think of it as being really... Uh, profoundly graced that particular book. It just, it just, it, nothing about writing it was easy. Nothing about, I even look at it now and think, I think it could be way better. I could, I could rewrite that. It would be better. But so I still, I don't think it's the best book that I've written, but no question. It just kind of tapped into some people and it took off. I mean, it offended the daylights out of people. I can't tell you how many, I mean, I lost really? some friends out of that. Oh, yeah, really? yeah. People, really? People I went through theological college with, some of my early colleagues in ministry were like, dude, that's, you know, I'm done. That, you know, it, it, they just found it was kind of offensive and some thought that I was really kind of um, kind of dismissing a bunch of stuff they had really kind of 
you know, built their lives on building, you know, the attractional uh, church model. Mm. I remember meeting one guy and he, he bought a, a copy of that book up for me to sign and it was just smashed to smithereens. It was like all, all, all bent out of shape and all the pages were all crinkled. And I said, wow, you've really like read this a lot. And he said, no, he said, I would read like 10 pages. I get so cranky, I'd throw it against the wall. And then I'd think, no, I can't keep going. Read another 20 pages, boom, <laughs> throw it against me. And he said, I finally got through it. And, you know, he thanked me for it. Obviously, he wanted me to sign it. But I feel like, yeah, for some people, when they engaged with it, it was a wrestle for them because it was really thinking, getting them to think about a, another paradigm for how we could view the church. Well, I, th- I figure if you haven't been called a heretic in your time, you're probably not trying hard enough, eh? I've had that thrown. Well, at I've you. definitely been called that. I've, I've had it thrown at me a couple of times. I've, I reckon there might have been a few people that wanted to throw my sermons up against the wall. I'm not an author; I'm a speaker, so it happens. I, I certainly appreciated keep Christianity weird. I would imagine in the attractional model of church, where everyone's trying to fit in, that would have been a fairly uh, pointed moment for some people as well. Yeah, I guess so. It, it certainly didn't sell as well. I have quite the same inf- impact as shaping of things to come, but. Um, but yeah, like when I was researching it, I was finding all these kind of websites and sermons and all sorts of things, all of which were training people in how not to be different. Mm. And had be, I mean, often you'd find if you just type, you know, you know, uh, Christianity or weird or being weird or something like that, all these things would come up where it was basically, hey guys, like love Jesus, but don't be weird about it. And I know what they meant. They meant don't be kind of obnoxious or strange or like a, a kind of a repellent kind of weird. But I was kind of trying to um, redeem the idea that uh, that actually we were always meant to be and have always been at our best actually out of kilt or out of step with with culture and society so let's not become so in step with it that we we look like uh, everybody else or, or there's no clear distinction in us other than that we happen to believe in god or jesus i had the privilege of meeting you the first time when you were very well wrapped as a gift from my church <laughs> uh on the uh, anniversary of i think it was my 10th year of serving as the senior leader in our church and so they gifted me to spend some time with you which was a, which was a really insightful gift because i've been tracking with you for some time in the shadows and you know tracking with your social media and your books and so on and what i wanted to do was to, to have a talk with you today um obviously a lot of what you do is missiology social justice and so on but i think we're in a moment right now uh, around the world and in australia with COVID 19 the pandemic running and so on that i'd love to just spend some time with reflecting on uh with you today um here in melbourne at the moment you're based in sydney but here in the melbourne at the moment we are in a six-week lockdown like it is lockdown. You can't visit your grandkids. You can't visit your grandparents. You're not out visiting your siblings and so on. Um, what, what's an outsider's view of what's happening in Melbourne? And when I mean outside, outside of Melbourne, of course, what's what's the, the kind of prevailing view of what's going on in our city right now? And yeah, give us a bit of a give us a bit of a thought in that space. Yeah, we feel for you. I mean. I think when when for early in the piece, when when it was just the sort of second wave was just taking off, and they closed the border and what have you, I think there are a few gags around about you know all oh, the dirty Victorians and mm-hmm. excise them from the country and ha ha ha. But when it kind of took off and we saw what a what a terrible mess uh, was unfolding there, and then when we heard about stage four, yeah, no, I think the the overall re- response is oh my gosh, that's we really feel for you. It it's it, it creates anxiety in us because, in a sense, we think, is this coming our way? Will this happen to us? Uh, why is it happening in Victoria and or Melbourne and not in uh, in Sydney? It might very well happen here. So there's also a sense like, oh, I wouldn't want to go back into into lockdown and those poor you know Victorians. So yeah, no, it's it's empathy and and concern and and of course you really want to see this thing under control in our country. I mean, mm. there are people dying, and mainly, not exclusively, but mainly elderly folks. I mean, I lost my mother a couple of years ago. She was living in a nursing home in the last couple of, or well, last year or so. And um, I couldn't imagine anything worse than not being able to see her and knowing that, you know, she could be or was infected. So, I mean, there's, for many 
Melbourneites, you know, there's there's trauma and grief associated with mm. this. It's uh, yeah, no, there's no Sydney Melbourne kind of you know rivalry or carry on here. Like we're definitely kind of feeling for you and praying for you. Yeah, appreciate that. And and I want to talk in a little bit about that issue of the hurting and the trauma and and how we minister in that moment. Um, one of the things I wanted to look at is. Um, anytime we see a challenge, anytime we face a trial, anytime we see something kind of pressing up against our belief systems, at you, it usually reveals the actual values and the essence of the culture of any person or organisation. And after time, any sustained challenge tends to have the capacity to strip away either political spin or church spin or anything like that. Like you can spin for a little bit, you can't do it sustained. Um, if we accept that concept that challenges reveal true culture uh, beyond that spin do you think that this current challenge is showing or revealing about Australia as a society and the church in Australia in those kind of two parts? What are you seeing? What are you experiencing? Yeah, well, Australia as a whole, it's um, it's certainly kind of put a, a microscope over um, particularly kind of middle class fears about or anxieties around scarcity. Um, so much middle class culture is about the the kind of setting off or the, uh, the the setting aside of any scarcity. So, having enough, having more than enough, is is a a, a clear aspirational goal. So, as soon as there's any possibility that there's not going to be enough pasta or toilet paper or meat or whatever the case may be, the panic buying thing just reveals to us actually not far below the surface there is a real fear about not having enough. Um, I was uh, the week before the kind of the original lockdown, the beginning of the year um, in March or whatever it was. Um, we had a, a guy from Kenya come and uh, preach at a theological college and at the chapel service. He preached, and and COVID was just taking off. And he's standing there saying, "I really feel for you. I'm really, you know, feel you know, I've been in Australia a little while and just watching you deal with this. It's really tough." He said, "You know, like disease is rampant and." The shelves are becoming emptied and there's panic and there's, you know, anxiety. And, and as he's as he's describing this, you know, it was all dawning on us, which is what he intended. Uh, oh, that's what it's like in yeah. Kenya all the time. Like, and, and here, here, was, here he was empathising with us, having come from a place where that's like a steady state reality. And it was a little shaming. I, I don't mean to say that he was shaming us, but it was this kind of like, oh, my gosh, like, what is wrong with us? So it did, it did reveal that, there's no question. Um, it's also revealed how fractured we are. You know, there is the kind of anti-mask kind of uh, conspiracy theory. There's no pandemic. It's not as bad as that. And other things are worse. And it reveals that there is that element in our society as well. It's not the major one, it seems, but it has revealed that it's there. We always think, oh, that seems like a more American thing, kind of, you know, sovereign citizens and, and people's rights and those kinds of things. But no, it's it's present. We've That's been revealed to us as some things have been, have been stripped back. Um, uh, our our uh, anxieties around government interventions and uh, whether it's government's role to, to, to run or manage these things, it's, it's raised those questions about polity. Um, but from my perspective, maybe even more interesting is what is it, what is it revealed about the church and yeah. all of those things are present in the church as well as society at large as well. But um, I heard it described once as being a, it's a little bit like we write what we think the church is in ink on a paper somewhere, but we also write in invisible ink what we really think and what, how we really behave. And it takes something like this to be like the lemon juice rubbed on that contract mm. that brings out the stuff that actually we don't really say, but in reality we really are. And mm. one of the chief things, of course, has been our overemphasis on a, on a Sunday gathering and, and the whole idea, like we would always say, well, no, we're a community of faith and we're a family and we're totally committed as a community. And Sunday is one of the things that we offer as well as a bunch of other ways. We connect in all sorts of ways. But you take the Sunday meeting away and people start to fall apart and pastors in particular get really anxious and 
had to work really quickly to pivot and put things online and then try to like tell people that that's just as important that you be part of that. But in fact, actually, I think it's helped to remind us of the fact that maybe we're not the kind of connected community that we are. Maybe we have emphasised attending more than belonging. Maybe we've expected the Sunday meeting to do way more than it's meant to do. And it's also raised questions around are we actually kind of really educating or equipping our congregations because we've relied so heavily on the sermon and the Bible study um, when they get taken away or modified in some way and we start to see, oh, hold on, maybe we could have been doing so much more about equipping our congregation than just asking them to listen to this. So it has it has actually uh, uh, forced us to rethink well, not rethink who we are, but it's it's reminded us, okay, maybe we haven't been what we've been saying that we are. And yet, I'd want to say, Phil, that actually this is a really golden opportunity. And I don't say that without being aware of the fact that there are people who are dying and it's a terrible tragedy, but it, it also could provide the church with some real insight into what's really important and what it means to be the church. Uh, my friend Alan Hirsch uses the... Um, the analogy of uh, teaching kids to play chess. And he says chess teachers will often say to their kids or their students when they're teaching them to play, I'm going to take your queen off the board and I want you to learn to play against me without a queen. That's your most powerful piece. Well, that's gone. So I want you to learn, you know, what pawns and rooks and, and bishops can do. And once you've learned to play, okay, it's like playing with like one arm behind your back, but you're going to learn what all these other pieces do and then we'll put our queen back and watch how exponentially you, uh, better you are at playing. Well, in a way, I think the Sunday service has been a bit like our queen. It's powerful. It's a really important thing. It's a great thing to gather and to worship. Preaching can have great effect. Uh, there's lots of marvellous things about the Sunday meeting. But maybe we've relied on it so much, we don't know what the rook and the pawns and the, and the, and the bishop and what have you do. And so maybe if our queen got taken away, it might not be so bad for us to figure out what community looks like, what discipleship looks like, what, uh, what mission looks like without reliance on that that piece yeah that that's a brilliant analogy I've, I've heard the one about if you're teaching someone to play you know take their queen away i've never thought about it in the context of what's going on right now that actually the in some senses the queen's been taken away and it is forcing us to learn the greater play and the, as you say the greater pieces a couple of thoughts that come out of what you've just said there i want to pick up on a couple of threads if i can um, one of them around the issue of the the scarcity response that we've seen the other one around the issue of that sunday response let me go to the scarcity uh, one first, um, as you know, we have seen extraordinary behaviour. Like we've seen toilet paper of all things was the first thing to go. Then pasta went and then pasta sauce went. And uh, last week when they started um, lockdown 2.0 here in Melbourne, the government came out and said, we are going to have the abattoirs go down one third in their production. Uh, within 24 hours, the shops were stripped of food. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, I, I've got to admit, I was walking around the shops looking in the meat section going, I don't even know if I need meat. I don't run that part of our home. But you know what? There's a couple of packets of meat there. Maybe I need to get it. In my previous life, I did a lot of work in aid and development and spent time in the slums of Kolkata um, with the, in the sex trade district of Sonagachi. Uh, and spent time walking around there and meeting some of these women who had been sold into the sex trade and sold into prostitution and were working the streets. It's one of the most extraordinary, not in a good way, extraordinary environments I've ever seen. But what I discovered in that moment was that the poor knew how to take care of each other really, really well. Uh, they looked after each other's kids. So school would go from 4 o'clock in the afternoon till 11 o'clock at night because the women were all out working. Uh, from four till 11. Um, mm. You know, they had a sense of community about it and they would sit around and have fire and meals together. So what is it in that scarcity thing of middle class? What is it do you think about the, that the poor have got something about this sharing model that we see in the early church that I don't know if, if we've lost it or we need to refine it or I don't know what the right term is there, but what is that, that we see that in the middle class, but not in the poor? 
Well, I mean, you're talking about a collectivist culture and we live in an, an individualistic culture. And there's good things about being individualistic and there's good things about being collectivist, but um, there are also bad sides of each of those kind of, uh, cultural um, perspectives as well. But, uh, yeah, what we discovered is that individualism doesn't help in the midst of a, of a pandemic or a crisis. Um, and so, yeah, like you, Phil, I was in a supermarket when the first kind of shutdown happened for us. And I just saw all the pasta was gone. I don't know what I was there for to pick up something else, but not pasta. And, you know, there was one or two boxes of pasta. I actually grabbed for them. I actually like, oh, I'm going to get these. And I thought, I stopped myself. I thought, whoa, like there's a, there is a, a spirit in this place. It's a spirit of fear and of mm. scarcity. And I'm affected by it. I think I would have grabbed that part just in just in case what just in, you know, in case somebody else grabs it is what I'm actually thinking, and so it's about I have to take care of me and my family, you know, rather than somebody else. So it's so invasive and it's so insidious, um, and it's because yeah, it, it has been we've been uh, living in a culture where individualism, care of self, care of own family, actually is is one of the kind of core values. Um, Interestingly enough, there's a number of people who these days are making film series or doing um, podcasts and the like about the way in which Western culture is indebted to Christianity for the kind of culture we've become. And I, I can see what they're doing there. Hey, it's kind of like, hey, 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 let's not abandon our kind of uh, understandings of Christianity. It helped shape who we are. But it also, in a strange way, shaped this form of individualism because, in particular, Protestantism... Uh, emerging out of the Reformation was about individuals making choices to follow Jesus. You can't rely on the fact that your family is Christian and it doesn't matter whether you were baptised as a baby. And I mean, I, I belong to the kind of the, the Baptist tradition. It's like it's it's like A1 individualism. It's like you have to stand before Jesus one day and so say, you make your choice yeah. about this. You can't rely on your family or your community or your village or anything like that. And so that has shaped Western culture, no question about it, particularly predominantly Protestant uh, countries like our own. I'm not saying Christianity makes you selfish. I'm saying it emphasises the individual and therefore, when left to its own devices, can, at its worst, turn into a, a form of individualism that's unconcerned about the other. And in that respect, I think it's the church ought to also say, oh, hold on, actually, that's not what we meant about the individual. The individual is important to God. God sees us all, loves us all. We are like the one lost son or the one lost sheep or the one lost coin. And in those stories, someone will turn the world upside down to find that one lost thing. So there is something beautiful about the notion of the individual dignity that comes out of, uh, out of Christian thinking. But unless it's put in its right perspective in a community, which is exactly the worldview of what, that Jesus had and that his initial followers had, it can kind of run rampant and turn into what we now see in terms of consumerism and greed and selfishness and individualism. And, and so back to that invisible ink or, you know, a magnifying glass, when the first, I don't know what it's like in Melbourne right now, I hope it's the same because when it first happened for us in Sydney, people were saying, I don't even know the name of that lady across the road. Like, mm. I've been living here for years and I wave at her and like, you know, or well, I know her first name and I don't know anything about her. And um, all of a sudden it was like, well, maybe I should. And people started letterbox dropping and people started saying, you know, can we pick up groceries for anyone in the street? And there started to be a kind of a connecting, like this tissue started to form where people started to connect to neighbours, which is what we always should have done all along. Yeah. Back to the whole mission thing, it's kind of like we say, go out and invite all your neighbours to come to church. Well, what chance is there of that if I don't even know the lady's name and all I ever do is wave as she's driving out? I meant to go from zero to would you like to come to my church and give your life to Jesus? It's just ridiculous. Mm. And so in a way, you know, lockdown did force us to recover the beauty of the street and of the neighbourhood, the, the actual immediate neighbours. And I think there's no bad thing about that. And I hope, and you guys have now got like two doses of it, I hope that that kind of connection to immediate neighbours and this kind of like we're in this together vibe actually kind of lasts and I hope Christians really 
pick up on it and say, yeah, this is something good we've discovered. Let's keep at this. And even if we're the ones that are continuing to promote it after lockdown, let us, let's do it. Let's, let's contribute to what it means to be neighbours. Yeah, you know, you, you talked a moment ago about that issue of, of fear that led you into the comment about being the neighbour. I must admit, again, if I'm, if I'm to be honest here, um, we had an occasion where my wife rang me up in the middle of the toilet paper scarcity uh, epidemic and um, she rang me up and she said, Phil, I got a pack of toilet paper. She's fairly enthusiastic about it. And she said, and I've just been talking to the lady who we've got to know who serves our local chicken shop of all things and we've got to know her and we talk with her and so on. She says, I really feel I'm meant to go give that paper to her in the chicken shop. Like it was like you had won the lottery and you had a gold bar. <laughs> and, and my first response, to be honest with you, straight away was, well, hold on a sec. Do we have any... Did you check with all your family? They've got any... Da, da. And she said, Phil, don't do that. I feel I'm meant to actually bless the lady in the chicken shop that we've got to know. And it was a real kind of almost a correction chastisement moment for me when I really felt what what actually brings you back to that fear motive as your first, like as your almost gut response. And it really caused me to sit back and think about it. Yeah. Out of that... Um, you know, we, we know in Scripture that God has not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, in church, I, I announced a week or so ago at church that we were not going to return to Sunday services for the rest of this year. Uh, our church received that really well. They understood it. They know my heart. They know the thinking behind it about being leaders in this moment in the space and, you know, the care and love for our people and the fact that we did a survey and we got the survey replies and all of that. It was interesting that the church seemed to have responded really well. But when I said it to a group of other Christian leaders, I, I have never seen eyebrows so instantaneously change shape as I saw in that section. Where's that line between I'm fearful that you've taken my queen away versus the opportunity that you've taken my queen away to learn and, and the line between I made that decision to not come back to church with our, our oversight because I believe it's expressing a sound mind, whereas other people would see it as fear. Where's the line between that sound mind fear, that that whole narrative, if, if you like, in a moment like this? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think it is fear if your neighbours are up in arms about your meeting and we don't want you, you know, following Jesus or Jesus is bad or you Christians are terrible, stop meeting. But that's, yeah, that's fear of persecution, you know, it's... If the government was telling us, you know, when you know, organised religion's bad, we're going to ask you all to kind of stop. Yeah, that's that's it, it, to comply to that is to kind of give in to a kind of a fear of persecution or, or of resistance or, or rejection. But that's not what's happening, as you know. And your decision to do it was based on the fact that there's a public health risk here, and we want to appear to be good neighbours. It doesn't mean we can't still meet. It doesn't mean that we can't still connect or yep. learn yep. or grow together. There's all sorts of ways we will do that. Um, so, yeah, I can understand not giving into fear if it were actual persecution. But when it's saying we're called to love our neighbour and, and here is our state saying, please, can you be good neighbours and can you close down businesses or stay socially distanced or wear masks or... Okay, we'll do that. Is there kind of complete science that tells us that masks work, or you know, is there is, was there Black Lives Matter, you know, protest and how come they get no? What does being neighbourly look like to say? Okay, this is what the state is thinking is best. If that's the best kind of public health advice that they're getting, we comply. We don't stop meeting. We just kind of find other ways to do it. Where where's the line? It's about. It's about balancing our needs and interests about gathering and learning and worshipping and, and the like against what it means to be good neighbours and also to be appearing to be good neighbours as well, to, to, to not just say this is neighbourliness, but for our neighbours to say good on the church for being so neighbourly at this time. I wonder also whether some of the anxiety among those leaders who raised eyebrows when you mentioned it is that you know, a lot of what it means for me to be me as a local church minister is to run that Sunday meeting, to spend a long time in preparation for the 
the sermon I'm delivering as well as the whole service. To It's a time where I get to see most people and I, uh, oops, the Lindens haven't been here for a couple of Sundays, mm. better follow up on them. There's a pastoral care dimension, particularly in smaller churches around attendance. I get all of that. I mean, it's, it, it, it is the queen, you know, it's, it's, it's doing a lot of work. And now you take that away. It's like, what am I spending my time doing? I mean, how does teaching work now? Is anyone listening to this live stream sermon? I don't even know if the Lindens are on or not. How do I find that out? How do I connect? You know, all of those questions just made a total shift in the way we do what we do. And for some people, what they do is so intricacy, intricately linked to who they are, mm. it feels like a real identity shake. It's kind of like, whoa, 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 hold on, how am I a church leader if I'm not doing all the things that I identify as as things that church leaders should do. So um, I understand it. I mean, we were talking before about the shaping of things to come and the reaction that I got from some people because insensitively, I, I admit, I didn't realise that when you kind of shake something that people really have invested identity and in their life into, it's perceived as you're attacking me. You're mm -hmm. telling me I'm wrong and what yeah. I've been doing is wasting my time and I didn't mean that but I inadvertently clearly indicated that and that would I understand why their reaction would be so strong to something like that I want to be sensitive to that but by the same token uh, I think you know we have to we have to provide kind of clear godly pastoral missional leadership to our congregations and let them know why we're making the choices we're making and um Generally speaking, it's good to hear what your congregation is doing, but generally speaking, I'd like to believe a lot of congregations would do what yours is doing and say, yeah, we, we can do that. I mean, if you abandon us to our own devices, then we'll go and watch some other church on live stream or we'll go read books or listen to podcasts. I think but people will if you probably provide them anyway. with other, Exactly. Yeah. If you provide them with a whole bunch of sort of auxiliary resourcing um, and capacity for connection, and yeah, totally. The church can still do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people tend to do that anyway. It's a great opportunity for us to 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 really see the level of Acts 242. They devoted themselves rather than I was devoted on their behalf for them, monitoring <laughs> yeah. them, controlling them. And it's a more, you've got to be a lot less control oriented, a lot more organic and trusting oriented if you're going to have a congregation that devoted themselves in that space um yeah. you know that, that that leadership issue obviously we we have things that we can learn in this moment on the other hand we are also ministering to a lot of trauma uh there are people who are hurting there are people who are uh are suffering you know I, I i've mentioned to you before that um my aunt rang me up and said you're my uncle in the netherlands uh lost his life to COVID. now he was mid 90s he had some comorbidity issues they she said he wouldn't have survived the fall he had anyway, but they've he's lost his life to COVID, which then caused me to have to go to the nursing home where the aged care home where my dad is and say, hey, dad, your favorite brother, the one he loved has passed away and dad can't do anything about that, can't attend live stream, can't mm. be part of it. We've seen people who are uh, traumatized. Uh, we've seen people who are hurting. A couple of thoughts around that. The ability to be honest enough to say I'm sad or to lament um, particularly in, in, in our stream, as it were, denominational background, is almost not a thing that's appreciated for the value it is. What, what's your take on this moment and the ability to actually be genuinely honest to say, I'm sad, or there's a lament here, and so on? Talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I know some people who know some people who have either had COVID and, and uh, recovered or a few who have passed away. But it, it hasn't uh, affected you know me or my social circle or faith community in, in the same way. But I have a friend in the Bronx in um, northern Manhattan who has lost 26 members of his congregation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's he's been conducting these kind of really weird sort of remote five-person funerals for people and uh he's really been impeded in terms of the pastoral care of grieving family members and, and the like and uh yeah he comes from a latino background 
kind of very passionate and expressive anyway. And I've actually been really touched by his impassioned kind of almost righteous anger against this bloody disease. You know, there's this feeling like, you know, I'm standing with these people and this is some kind of invasive enemy that's come in and taken life and, and destroyed families. And I've actually found his kind of passion and his, in a sense, his kind of defence of his people, you know, not I'm angry at Donald Trump, I'm angry at, you know, the governor of New York. It hasn't been like that. It's not partisan. It's like, you know, there's a kind of a like a pastoral fury, like a like a mother lion. I'm trying to protect these these ones. And and his expression of that actually has been really quite affecting. I mean, for me as a outsider just just watching it. And it reminds us that, you know, pastoral ministry is about presence, it's about um attentiveness and not just checking whether the Lindens haven't been in church for a couple of weeks, but, you know, being genuinely attentive and listening and present. And at this particular time, I think so, obviously, all the more so. I think it's important that pastors recognise that that pastoral care is not just about checking up on attendance or all things being equal, well, let me know if there's a problem, but rather sitting with a person's sense of trauma or grief or sadness or anxiety and um, providing opportunities for that are difficult, particularly in lockdown, but there's, we've just got to get as clever and as creative about that as we are about, you know, getting services live streamed and the like. Um, you know, genuine listening is incredibly important in mission as much as in, in pastoral care. Uh, what does it mean for us to actively engage and actively listen? And frankly, you know, I think, I think Australians generally suck at it, but that includes Australian Christians. Uh, you know, my wife and my daughter, my, my wife and my youngest daughter are both both social workers. You might say they're kind of professional listeners. You know, they they have been trained in active listening, and they say, you know, it just breaks their hearts that they engage with people just naturally now to like that. But they say, and it's been interesting watching my. My uh, my daughter in her late twenties saying, "You know what? I'm just figuring out. It never comes back. Like no one ever mm. really wants to listen to me or be genuinely attentive to me. And it's really heartbreaking to say, I know, honey. Like that's you, you know, of all people, you'd think you who are able to be so genuinely present would get it bouncing back in some way. But we are generally. I mean, I'm talking about our culture broadly." are just so self-focused and so, I mean, my wife says, really it should be the opposite of of, uh, of talking should be listening. But for lots of people, the opposite of talking is waiting. Right. Just waiting until you finish talking and I'm going to say my thing that you triggered in my mind. I, honestly, I reckon in terms of discipling people, equipping them to be active listeners, to be good at being attentive, to showing uh, an interest, to having a genuine curiosity in others. I mean, these are these aren't spiritual gifts. These are just practices and skills I think the pastors shouldn't just have. They should have them, but they should also be equipping others in them. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because I um, I also serve as a chaplain in the Defence Force in the Army. And one of the things that is, is taught to us quite strongly in our training is the ministry of presence, not the ministry of fixing. Uh, yeah. And I think in a church realm, we, we run to a motif that says we have the answer for everything. But there was an interesting statistic, and I, I just the, the name of the author escapes me at the moment, where he talks about the questions Jesus asked. And the statistic was that Jesus asked 308 questions in his time on earth. He was asked 185 and only ever directly answered eight. So it's almost a 40 to 1 ratio of questions asked to direct answers he gave. And then the author breaks down the eight and four of them were just times he just said to the disciples, you're not getting it, here's the answer. Is part of the challenge in, in a moment like this that we, we, we want people to have a come to Jesus moment, but we're presenting always trying to fix with the answer rather than actually doing what Christ did, which was to ask the question. And in fact, I think the world has flipped the narrative on the church where now it's the world asking the questions going, well, why shouldn't we have gay marriage? Why shouldn't we have this? Why shouldn't we have that? And the church is going, ah, oh, we're not used to, you know, try to acquit it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you think that part of it in a season like this is we need to recapture the Christ of asking questions and listening 
and hearing because you see that modeled in Jesus more than you see that really modeled in a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. No, no doubt about it. I think, well, you probably mix in more pastoral circles than I do, but I mean, I, I, I'll never forget actually being, sometimes, uh, well, I'll never forget being at a conference and I walked into a, um, a session in the room I was about to present in, but the previous session hadn't quite ended. And it was about um, leading your family on mission. And the, the guy was taking uh, questions at this point, and somebody says, somebody said to him, um, you know, I've got three kids and my two daughters love coming to church and they're, you know, active and engaged and they think it's terrific, but my son hates church. He doesn't want to come every Sunday morning. It's a battle. We've got to kind of, you know, get him in the car and he moans and groans and hates it and blah, blah, blah. What would you do about that? Now, I was sitting there thinking, how could you answer that question? Like, I mean, there would have to be like a, uh, like a million questions to ask in response to that. Like, is he being bullied in the church? How old is he? Does he have a peer group there? What, who's teaching? What's going on? You know, there, there's just so many questions. What's his preferred style of leading, uh, learning? How does he cope, cope with school? Is that the same as church? I mean, how could you begin to answer that question uh, without knowing so much more? But I sat there amazed as this pastor went, oh, that's easy. You need to, and then it was like boom, 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 like these like three or four things that you should do in response. Some of which, if the kid had real issues, about, I mean, could, he, could he have been being abused in the church or mm. could he have been bullied? In the, I mean, no, no idea, but some of them I thought could have been quite destructive without knowing the full story. It occurred to me, I mean, that is the kind of the male answer syndrome actually kind of then ratcheted up with the kind of the notion of being a spiritual leader. I've got to know everything about everyone and just have an answer for every possible kind of problem or issue. Well, that's very, very unhelpful. I mean, again, I remember being at, at a at doing a seminar on, on a mission and someone said, oh, uh, our, our house church has got, uh, you know, 12 people in it. Do you think we should divide, you know, into two groups of six? Or do you think we should get bigger and then, or should we send off four? And then and I said, well, well, stop. I said, I've got no clue how that should work. I don't know the 12 people. I don't know how many leaders. I, I don't know. You could tell me all that and maybe, but I don't know. And I remember, like, people started laughing. And later people were saying, oh, we've never heard, a, like, a, a minister say something like that. Like, most of them are like, yeah, six and six, go, do it now. <laughs> or, you know, split it, you know, seven and five. You know, it's just like, and I, I feel as though a lot of ministers, and this could be more men than women, that would be an interesting question to interrogate. But definitely there's this kind of like, I should know stuff. Well, Actually, yeah, maybe what we need to be better at is just listening to stuff and to be more present to stuff and actually start to ask a few questions. Maybe that person could figure out what the 12 people in the house church should do themselves, you know. like So, yes, it's likewise with grief and pain and trauma. Oh, here's what you need to do. Like, here's a great website for you. Here's a book you should read. I've always found Joe Blow to be really good, like read some of his stuff. Maybe it's just simply sitting. I mean, I can remember the first time I was with someone when they passed away. It was an older woman and she died of cancer. And her husband and I sat with her for about pretty much the whole day, the last day of her life. And I had no clue what to say. I was like in my mid-20s. I'd never even seen a dead body or been with anyone who died. I completely out of my depth. I was desperately thinking all day. It's a long, it's all day, thinking what what would a smart pastor say right now? You know, I've said all the prayers. I've, I've quoted all the Bible verses I can, you know, think of that apply. I'm, I'm done. And so most of the day he and I sat there in silence and then she passed and I prayed and I held her, her husband, um, not for very long because he's a real blokey bloke, but we, we held, you know, we did the funeral. And at the wake, I remember him in front of others saying, oh, Mike, you're such a great pastor. That day that you and I spent with Betty, everything you said was just so powerful. I mean, the way you spoke and led me through that experience was just so magnificent. Well, I didn't say anything, and it, it occurred to me then, this was very early in my ministry, just me being present, like, spoke mm. 
to him. Like he heard me saying things simply because I didn't leave because it was lunchtime. I didn't go because I had another appointment. I just held Benny's hand for the whole day and was with her when she passed. So just like, well, as you say, in chaplaincy, I mean, so much of what we need to do is to learn just the power of presence and of asking appropriate kind of questions uh, that help to shed the people through a process. And sure, I get it. <clears throat> there may come a time when it's like, oh, here's a book that would help or you know, here's a course you might like to consider doing. And I think that ought to come a long way down the track in terms of our engagement with people, particularly when they're in trauma and grief. Yeah, and I think that, that that's an, it's an interesting uh, lead to the, the, the thought that I have in my mind around we are ministering from a, from a leadership, from a church, from an individual, from a neighbourhood point of view. We are ministering in very real trauma in this season, business trauma, job trauma, you know, health trauma, lost family members, all of that wide scope of what's going on. At the same time, we have an opportunity and a learning moment to, to actually say, well, you know, yes, I'm ministering to trauma and, not or, and we have this opportunity that is emerging, which I don't want to look uh, almost callous towards the person who's in trauma. I want to I want to use this moment to reshape, to rethink, to learn how to play chess, as you say, without my queen. But I recognize there are people. How do you balance those two dynamics? And then I've got one more question before we finish because our time's gone. But how do you balance those two dynamics of, yes, I'm ministering some, but I also want to lead a learning process out of this moment? Yeah, I don't know. Well, how in terms of uh, what percentage of time given to what, it really depends on on uh, what level of trauma. How many people in your church have lost jobs or are losing lives or know people who've lost lives? Um, uh, but I also feel like for the most part, a lot of Christians are like, can we get on with this? Like, uh, okay, we get it. We can't meet on, you know, Sunday in person. and uh, But... What, what do we need to be? What do we need to do? How do we how do we uh, move through this? Um, and actually providing people with the resourcing to um, rethink what it means to learn and grow, rethink what it means to be good neighbours and to engage in mission. I think people are up for that, actually. So, yeah, it's not like out the front I'm talking to the whole thousand people in my church and like, shh, Cracking the whip, let's go, we can get them. Because I know there are people there who can't go anywhere. They, they're in grief. But the fact that we're all now kind of separated uh, and in our homes actually does allow for a more bespoke approach to people that we're engaging with. And so I think that, you know, it, it has forced us to actually engage in, in much more uh, personal kind of ways. And I think that balance well it just depends on you know what what your congregation is currently kind of going through yeah. um but you know i was talking to a woman the other day in our church she's in a whatsapp group with all the mums from her school from a kid's school they all do lots of whatsapping about you know all the time you know about kids and homework and just all the general stuff now they're all WhatsApping about homeschooling and how they deal with their kids. And she said that's led on to a whole lot of questions about what's going on. Is this the end of the world? I mean, is, you know, we're going to have an economic collapse. We've got pandemics. We've got China, you know, emerging. Uh, there's there's explosions in Beirut. There's like, like, holy crap, you know, is this world, like, what's going on? And so she said oh, these conversations on WhatsApp have actually turned into really significant spiritual, philosophical conversations. And she's saying to me, where's the line? Do I just like, blur? I believe Jesus died for our sins? Or do I say, oh, actually, God's in control? Do, how do I tease? How much is too much? And how much is not enough? And, and I said, uh, Nelly, um, were these not issues for you before mm. COVID? And she had to stop and think for a while. It's like, no, yeah, they weren't. And I think, hey, 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 you know, that ought to always have been the question that Christians had. And churches always ought to have been coaching them through how to deal with that. Now, we're going back to the invisible ink kind of thing. Okay, now that's brought that to the fore. But what good is a church if it's not equipping people to be able to respond to those kinds of issues? 
How do I care for the elderly lady across the road? How do I talk about Jesus in a WhatsApp group? How do I show generosity in a time of, of fear of scarcity? I mean, that has always had to have been our, our agenda. That's what discipleship is. What does it look like to become more and more like Jesus in our neighbourhoods and our communities? Well, okay, I've been able to kind of fake that I'm pretty cool with Jesus because I just turn up every Sunday. Well, now I don't turn up every Sunday. And so now it's like, I can't fake that anymore. I'm in a WhatsApp group. Help me, Phil. What do I say? I, you know, the lady across the road's husband just passed away. How do I deal with that? Um, what should I say? How do, like, that is the stuff of of discipleship. And I reckon, I hope to think, that pastors would just be like pigs in mud when this happens. It's like, this is what I was born to do. I was actually called to help people become more like Jesus. So, okay, you're only going to get a 10-minute talk this, this Sunday. I'm going to spend half as long as I normally spend preparing messages because I'm doing like a coaching session on how to talk about Jesus on WhatsApp. I'm talking about the five things to keep in mind as you're caring for the your elderly neighbour or ministering to people whose, whose partners have passed away or whatever the case may be. Um, you would have thought it'd be like, yes, this is the real stuff. Let's get to it. How can I help? Um, so I hope that's what pastors are doing. And I want to thank you for writing my sermon for this Sunday, Mike. Thank you for giving me <laughs> the sermon outline. But no, I, I, I think that's very, very true. My last question for you if I can um, and, and I would love at another time to come back and talk more about the, the social justice the missiology part I just feel that in this season this is obviously a topic that's got our both our attention and an opportunity attached to it um, we know that when this season started and we've talked about the Sunday and we've talked about you know being more neighbor oriented and, and some of the changes that have happened there and again to use the analogy of the chessboard and so on um, and, and when it originally all started and everyone pivoted to online, we were all counting, you know, how many views did we have? And there was a real surge in that moment, which predictably has collapsed across the board, yep. uh, where now people are not watching what they were, et cetera, et cetera, which is, again, caused us to go back to, well, well, now we know our default setting when you take the when you take that out we, we've kind of discovered something in that process and i'm talking generally not just our church but just in general terms what would be one piece of encouragement you would give to people not just church leaders but everybody who's listening to this in this season about what it means to be the church in a moment like this what, what's that kind of one piece of encouragement you'd say you know what you need to think about this do this whatever that be from your perspective what's that one thing you know it's that out of the city slickers, he says, when you get to know the one thing, and he says to him, what's the one thing? He said, you'll know the one thing. So what's Mike Frost's one thing in this moment? Well, the one thing is like, what does the reign of God look like and how do I help people to see it even in the midst of all the kind of the, the shit and the brokenness of pandemics and economic collapses and depressions and goodness knows what's going to happen, Donald Trump's re-election or whatever the case may be. Um, you can get obsessed by that stuff. So, I mean, just to sum up what we've been saying all along, you can get obsessed by let's hang on to that, that roll of toilet paper, honey, or let me grab that, that last box of pasta. Or, Am I going to keep my job or what's the future going to look like? And I'm not discounting those, but that's not the one thing. So the, the one thing is our God reigns. Our God is king. Mm. And Jesus rules, like literally. So what does the reign and the rule of Jesus look like in this world? I mean, it looks like, I think it looks like justice and reconciliation. And it looks like beauty. It looks like healing and wholeness. And so I would say the one thing is how can I alert people to the fact that there's another world which has come, which is seeping into this world inexorably and throughout history and will ultimately one day be our, our, our steady state reality. How does my life alert people to that? So how do I show people, well, we have, as you said, we haven't talked about justice or reconciliation, but how do I show people what hope looks like or what peace looks like or what generosity looks like? Um, so the one thing would be, like, take responsibility for the fact that you've been called to alert everyone to the reign of God and start to learn again and again what does the reign of God look like? 
how do I get to reveal that to people? That could be words in a WhatsApp. That could be an act of kindness or generosity. That could be giving away my toilet paper or whatever the case may be. But what does it look like for me to see myself as someone who's sent to alert people to the fact that another world is here and is coming? Uh, and then to church leaders, I would say, how can you help to equip us in a bespoke individual way to each different person's station and needs to actually be those kinds of people? Um, and that's not some kind of new agenda. That's what our agenda should have been all along. Yeah, very good. Mike, thank you so much for joining me for the second time. Uh, <laughs> it's just been phenomenal to talk. We could talk. It was better than the second time, Phil. It was better the second time. It was better. It's amazing what a bit of rehearsal could do. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. If people want to track with you, know more about what you're doing and so on, where, where, how, do they, how do they track with you, find you? Where is it? I know you've got a website. Well, if they want to read any books, you know, you can just Google Michael Frost. Uh, I've got a website, which is mikefrost.net. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can find talks of mine online and all that kind of jazz if you, if, well, I guess if you're all in lockdown, get <laughs> online and watch all my talks, people. <laughs> Very good. Mike, thank you so much. We really appreciated your time today. It's been really good for me, for everyone who's listening. So we, we thank you so much, hey? Thanks, Phil. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.